committee's second meeting of 2018. There are no apologies, but Liam MacArthur has indicated that he will be later due to flight disruptions. Agenda item number one is a declaration of interest um, from our new member, and it's my pleasure to welcome Daniel Johnson to the Justice Committee. And um, Daniel, could you declare any interest? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your welcome, Kamina. Um, I have no uh, direct interest to declare, but I would like to make members aware that my wife is a practicing solicitor. Okay, thank you for that. Agenda item number two is the decision on taking item six in private, which is consideration of our forward work programme. Are we all agreed? Agreed. agreed thank you. Uh, agenda item number three is consideration of a negative instrument. This is the notice to local authorities Scotland amendment number two regulations 2017 SSI 2017 oblique 421. I refer members to paper one which is a note by the clerk. The committee has until the 22nd of January to report to the parliament. Do members have any comments? No comments. Um, is the committee therefore agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Thank you. I spend briefly now to allow witnesses for the remand round table to take their seats. Okay. Agenda item four is the round table evidence session on remand. The purpose of the round table is to explore issues around the use of remand in Scotland as well as the experience of prisoners held on remand. I welcome all our witnesses to the committee's round table evidence session and suggest that we perhaps start by introducing ourselves and going round the table to do so. I'm Margaret Mitchell, I'm the convener of the Justice Committee. Uh, I'm Gail Scott, I'm one of the clerks to the Justice Committee. I'm Diane Barr, I'm one of the clerks to the Justice Committee. Uh, Philton McGregor, MSP for Coatbridge and Crescent. Anthony McGean, Procurator Fiscal for Policy and Engagement from Crown Office. Good morning, Ben McPherson, MSP for Edinburgh Northern and Leith. Morning, Ben. Uh, uh, John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. And David Strang, the Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland. Mayor, MSP for the North East Region. Maurice Curry, MSP for this West Scotland Region. Good morning, Theresa Medhurst, Scottish Prison Service, Director of Strategy and Innovation. Marie Goujon, I'm the MSP for Angus North and Mairns. George Adam, Paisley's MSP. And Pinkman, representing the Scottish Working Group on Women Offenders and the Prison Reform Trust. Uh, Daniel Johnson, member for Edinburgh Southern. Rona Mackay, MSP for Strathkelvin and Bearsden and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Thank you. By way of explanation, part of the roundtable session is to encourage a free exchange of views, and this includes witnesses addressing each other um, directly and expressing views rather than simply responding to questions. However, <laughs> in order to maintain some kind of discipline with it, um, it would be helpful if you could speak directly uh, to direct your comments through the chair. And if you wish to speak at any point, please indicate to me or the clerks, and this will be noted. And there's no need to press anything as if by magic, then uh, it's your time to speak and your microphone will go on. Um, I refer members to paper two, which is note by the clerk, and paper three, which is a private paper. And I wanted to start with, Police Scotland aren't represented here, but in the written submission, they say, remand is a permitted breach of ECHR Article 5, the right to liberty but breach must be proportionate, necessary, legitimate, and subject to appropriate scrutiny and ongoing review. Are these conditions being met at, at present in Scotland as regard remand? And anyone can start. 
Is it strong? Thanks very much, um, convener. Um, I mean, I think the qualification that they put on the right to liberty is just a common sense one, that clearly if someone breaks the law in a serious way, then as from a police point of view, they'll be uh, detained, arrested, and then kept in custody for court. And the more serious the case, the more likely they are to be detained. And in my view, the use of, of detention of, of prison of remand is about protecting the public from further harm. And therefore, I don't think anyone would quibble that it is perfectly uh, legitimate and proper that someone who poses a risk and a threat to society is um, detained in custody for however long that need be. And if, if someone is a very serious offender, then clearly they might, uh, at, at the end of a, a court case on, on conviction, be sentenced to life imprisonment. So, you know, that's at the harshest end. I don't think anyone is saying that that detention is, is a fundamental breach of the human rights. So I think what they're saying is that the, the right to liberty that we all enjoy is a qualified one. And if you behave in a certain way that particularly threatens others in society and causes harm, then in a way you have forfeited that right to liberty. And, and if, as long as there's due process and the rule of law is followed, um, then to answer your question, I, I think in those circumstances, um, the, the um, human right has, has not been breached. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that the terminology is exactly right that it's breached. I think it's a qualified right, and in circumstances, it is perfectly uh, legitimate and justified uh, to remove that right. And is it just um, if it's a threat to the public? There's another um, condition that's, that's often used for remand or um, which is... Flight didn't... Yes, I, so, so my comments were, were more a personal view that that is what imprisonment should be used for. Um, but in terms of, of the legislation, then, yes, if, if there's... Um, and I don't know exact terminology, but if it's suspected that someone will interfere with witnesses and so corrupt the, the due pros, process of law, then that's a ground. If there's a fear that someone um, might flee and, and, and um, leave the country, then I think that's another reason... Um, that that's perfectly legitimate, as long as there are good grounds and it's not a, an arbitrary uh, decision. But I suppose what I'm wanting to communicate is that I think those bars are quite high, and you'll see from my submission that I think remand in prison before trial is used too frequently um, when perhaps there's a, a, a minor fear of someone not turning up at court or reoffending, and then the, the only alternative seems to be, well, let's remand them in custody until trial and I think I would like to encourage society and the parliament to consider other ways of ensuring that people uh, attend court for their trial. Right, having set out you know, what sh seems to be the criteria for, for this breach then I suppose the question is how much is that followed uh, through and to what extent are other people being held without meeting that criteria? <laughs> yes, Anne. Sorry. Anne? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I think the statistics that have been provided by uh, in our submission and the other submissions <coughs> um, indicate that the, um, there is an increasing use of, of remand um, over recent years. And the, the fact of the matter is using women as a, as a, as a good example. Um, we see more women um, uh, remanded into custody than, than males and only 30% of women who remanded go on to get a custodial sentence. I think that um, far more use should be made of alternatives to remand. And using your example of uh, individuals who, for example, may flee, the, I know that the government are currently looking at use of electronic monitoring, and to me that would seem an ideal example of consideration for, um, for, for, for that. Um, but there's also supervised bail, which is shown to be extremely effective, much more efficient and far, far less disruptive than the effects of imprisonment on individuals and their families. Okay. Any other views? Um, if that's the case, why, why are we doing this? Um, any other views from the, um, the cooperative fiscal, etc.? Because I think Anne covered the necessary bit, legitimate, um, proportionate. Um, one, one view Mr McGeehan um, proffered was it was to ensure they were perhaps in place. The remand players were, were you know, the prisoners were in, in place to, to appear at court. Would, would that be um, something that 
you would recognise as a reason? I would suggest that the, <clears throat> the reasons for reminding an accused person can be broadly categorised under two headings. The first would be public protection. The second would be administration of justice. Um, that administration of justice um, and the issues in relation to the effect of administration of justice may take a variety of different forms. Uh, one of those forms may be, for example, not attending trial diets or, or, or future diets of the court. Um, and that is a feature of remand in Scotland. Um, and there are mechanisms that may be available in different locations across the country that would mitigate that risk. Um, and as Anne has said, there are possible mechanisms in the future that may also assist to mitigate that risk, such as electronic monitoring. But electronic monitoring is not currently available um, in terms of a risk mitigation measure. Is there anything um, that you'd like to add, uh, Theresa, from, from your perspective? Um, I mean, we, obviously, our role is to take those who are sentenced by the courts, whether that be on um, remand or convicted. Um, in general terms, the, the remand figures, from our perspective, seem to have been fairly stable um, over um, uh, the recent, recent times. Um, but there certainly um, with regards to the, the implications and the impact of a period of remand, um, then there are quite significant implications when somebody is taken into custody, both in terms of their family, life, their um, home, their stability. Um, so we, we see that kind of experience for those coming into custody regardless of, of sentence. Okay. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, so if, if we look at the ethos uh, which a number of you talked about behind why remand could be used. Do we have any data on why remand actually is being used? So is there, has there been any analysis done as to which of the... So some of the reasons protecting public from harm, uh, corrupting the process, flee risk. Is there any data done uh, to look at why remand has been used in each particular case? Do you know? Uh, Mr. Mickey, uh, uh, is it Anthony? Yeah. It's Anthony. Yeah. Um, if I if I could uh, respond, I'm not aware of any data in relation to reasons of remand being kept. The court makes the decision as to whether or not to remand an individual, um, and there may be a headline reason for that remand, or the remand may result from a number of different factors that combined. Do you know? Do, no, do they I, that, have that's to write what, it down? I, Here's why I've done remand in the, this case. The, the, sh the court are, is obliged by statute to articulate why they are remanding an individual. Um, I presume that the sheriff or the court would record the reasons for that remand, but in terms of any data capture um, of, that, of those reasons, I'm not aware of any data set that would allow us to understand why individuals or rem remanded or on a systemic basis to understand the profile of reasons behind remand for the current prison population. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Anne? I, I would agree with that and I think it's, 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 it's wrong that we don't have that, that data and we should have that data given that sentencers are obliged to make that, that, that matter known. Anecdotally, we do know that a lot of, of individuals who are remanded in custody are remanded for failing to appear, for example, for um, criminal justice social work reports. Um, uh, sentencers are obliged in, in many circumstances to have a criminal justice social work report prepared before they can impose either a custodial sentence for many individuals, not all, and certainly for any individual who's to be made subject to a community payback order. Um, if an individual, and very often these individuals have chaotic lives, they will fa fail to appear for court, but too little is being done on a national basis to assist individuals uh, to appear at court on, on the required date. There is very little use made of, for example, stand-down reports. Um, it is the um, sentencers are, are, are able, rather than continue a case for two or to three weeks for a criminal justice uh, social work report, they, they do have the ability to ask the court social worker to do what's known as a stand-down report, whereby the case would be continued for two or three hours. 
there is very little use made of that. And, uh, and that is surprising given that many individuals who appear before the courts are known both to the courts and to criminal justice social work services. The court social workers should be able to access previous court social work reports um, electronically from the court social work base and from there interview the individual, access that information and then present a verbal report to the sentencer. I do find it frustrating that that, 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 that um, function or ability is not used by sentencers and something that should, should be encouraged. Likewise, mentoring services such as Shine, they, do, they are very successful in working with women um, and they will literally accompany women to court, thus reducing the need for remands for failure to appear. John Finney, then David Strang. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on the, the point that Anne made there, uh, uh, and it's about the time frames in which we, we, we have to operate, because um, he, the scenario is that, of course, someone has to be retained in custody by the police before the situation would be, and then they would have to be put to the court. Um, and the time frame can be very short, um, but um, is, is there no examples of experience being drawn on when it is often the very, as you said, the very same people who are coming back, the experience? So that's not something, Mr McGeehan, that, for instance, the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service would have that could inform it? Decision making, sorry. If I, if I could pick up um, on the, the constrained timescale and, and then the awareness of, of, a, a, of a person who repeatedly appears in front of the same court and how that might impact upon the decision making process. You're absolutely right that, 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 that we're dealing with a, with a time critical process whereby a person who is arrested um, by the police may be arrested up until midnight the preceding day um, and is required to be brought before the court by the next lawful day, which means that in real time the police um, only have the next working day to report that case to COPFS and COPFS in turn only has the next working day in which to properly consider that case, um, identify whether there is a sufficiency of evidence and identify whether or not proceedings in the public interest and then identify whether or not bail should be opposed in the event of that accused person pleading not guilty when brought before the court. Um, so any attempt to ingather information is an additional step within an already time critical process and that's one of the challenges in relation to schemes such as bail supervision. In terms of the parties already being aware of that individual, uh, then uh, yes, a knowledge of that individual may accelerate that process, uh, but not so much in the part of the police or COPFS but more on the part of the defence agent who's regularly appearing on behalf of that accused person and also the criminal justice social worker who in the real world would be sitting in court, it would be aware of the individual who they are seeing on a regular basis in that court and may well be already aware of the issues that that individual has and the support that may be appropriate for that individual. So there is a, a knowledge within the system of individuals, uh, but that would be most relevant in relation to the criminal justice social worker who is perhaps looking to assist the court in its decision-making process as to whether or not bail supervision is appropriate for the individual or uh, remand is the appropriate decision for that individual. Okay. Yes, yeah, John. And yeah. accepting the, the, the time constraints. Presumably that's information that would inform whether uh, the, the fiscal in court was going to object to the individual being released in bail can that not be collated, uh, as has been suggested by Anne, in a way that would mean reducing the likelihood? I appreciate there'll be accommodation issues and there'll be time constraints, and I'm conscious too that we haven't been in touch with uh, social work, criminal justice social work for their comments on this, but presumably it's all doable if, if there was some flexibility. Again, I suppose criminal justice social work would be the best place to, best place to, to comment on that as to whether or not they have a bank of information in relation to an individual that they could deploy in the event of those persons who are regularly in front of the courts. But, uh, I'm somewhat surprised then, if, if the, the, the fiscal has to make a decision on representations they're going to make to the sheriff regarding what happens to the accused, whether they are to be remanded or whether they are... So, so presumably there's information that the Crown Office Appropriate Fiscal Service have, whether 
uniquely or shared with criminal justice the, social work? The, the information that the, the, the COPFS would have uh, would relate to the accused criminal offending. Um, it wouldn't relate to his or her personal circumstances, his or her personal issues, um, and the support that may be available for that individual dependent upon the nature of their current situation. Okay, I, I would have hoped there, there would have been information sharing that may well have informed previous decisions about bail. You know, I would understand that you may well know if someone's offended whilst they're on fail, bail, but... Um, yeah, Sorry, please. I mean, it's, it's fair to say that the provision of court social work services varies considerably across um, the courts um, across, across Scotland and indeed you can have a single court social worker who may be covering two or three courts at one time and that brings with it its own challenges. That said, there, there are uh, examples, uh, pockets of very good practice, and one, one which I cited in the, in, in the evidence that I submitted in advance of today is the supervised bail project in Glasgow that's, that's run by two voluntary organisations, and they receive uh, in advance of uh, each morning a copy of the court list, the custody lists, and the workers are able to go into the police or court cells and interview, in this case it's women, and interview the women who are in custody, um, explain to them the support that's available through the supported bail service, encourage their support or willingness to agree to a, 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 support, a supervised bail um, order, and from there ask them to inform their defence agent um, that they have been interviewed and willing to um, to comply with a supervised bail order should the sheriff be willing to consider that. So that's proactive, but that's only one example, and it is patchy, um, and it is frustrating that similar, very efficient, effective, and time and cost saving um, projects are not available on a national basis. And I think that's something I would encourage the the justice committee to ask why and why that could not be available on a, on a national basis. I'm going to bring David Strang and then I think you had a point to, to raise, Fulton. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I, mean, I think the administration of justice is a legitimate uh, aim, certainly from a victim's point of view, um, you know, the, and, and for the accused, the, the, the trial should be as timious as possible and uh, delays by witnesses not turning up or the accused not turning up. It, is something that needs to be needs to be countered. Um, for those who are remanded in custody, it's more likely um, that if they've already been involved in the system, they've already been um, uh, convicted of, of offences. I think it's more likely that they will be remanded in custody um, on the basis of their criminal history, which of course um, doesn't necessarily justify uh, remanding in custody at all. And I think the statistic that Dan mentioned earlier on this morning of, of the women, this was in the um, Angelini uh, Commission report, that 70% of women who are remanded in custody when it comes to disposal of the case do not then end up in prison, either because they've served time or the, the case is dropped or they're uh, not convicted. Um, and so I just think that that's evidence that we are overusing uh, remand as um, in some ways, I mean, I'm overstating this, but as an administrative function to make sure that the trial can go ahead when um, there are um, successful uh, schemes to support people on bail uh, to make sure that they uh, turn up at court, um, but they are very patchy. And um, uh, as, as Anne has just mentioned, um, there are some good schemes in some parts of Scotland, but you know, there really should be uh, those support services available throughout, throughout Scotland. Okay, Fulton, you'd uh, a point uh, to make I was just one. picking up on the, the points here and the, the sort of national discussion, and I do think that I wonder if there is something there been talking about remand particularly, because you don't need a, a criminal justice social work a report for a remand, it's for a full custody. Um, and actually, I mean, I'll, I'll declare an interest here, uh, uh, still registered with the Scottish Social Services Council and a, a previous criminal justice social worker. And a lot of the time, based on a, a, a social work office, we, we got told, you know, later on that, that the remand uh, had, had been made. And, you know, if, if maybe we had been discussed with uh, the local office as well, uh, that there could have possibly been another outcome. So what I'm suggesting, uh, getting to the point of what I'm suggesting, is that it seems just now if there's a bail a supervision officer or a court social worker on site, then yes, they will be consulted 
Um, but if there's not, and you've talked about the, the patchiness of the service, which is um, due to resources and, and, and everything else, that um, you know it, it, it's it's perhaps not not the same every part of the country. But there is a local social work office everywhere in the country uh, doing you know criminal justice service. So if there's any way that that could be tied up between the different uh, services, but of course in all that as well, we do need to respect that the, the sheriff uh, and the court. Uh, has the right to, to make decisions comes up in this committee quite a lot, but that's something that personally, from my experience, I'd quite like to see a bit more of. So that that and that might reduce the need for uh, for remands. Um, Somewhere the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service could intervene and say, you know, before we make a decision, you know, would the court, you know, give us allow a little time to contact the local office? Uh, do you recognise what folk would can, can, can I just say that before you, you bring Mr. Uh, McKinnon? I think it needs to be more fluid than that. I think it needs to be more about local practice, relationships, development, and, and maybe the, 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 the PFN service would have a, a role in, in bringing that together, but I think it needs to be... Well, your view, Ms. Mr McGee. Um, if, I, if I can pick up on a, a couple of points that, that have been made and, and maybe return to the, the, the point in relation to the availability of, of, of social work input. Um, <clears throat> Firstly, in relation to bail supervision, um, I would absolutely agree that that, that that is an effective support mechanism for accused persons. Um, but I think we would have to be cautious before <coughs> concluding that there's a direct correlation between the availability of bail supervision and the reduction in remand numbers. And the reason that I say that is that um, the Scottish Government led on a, a penal improvement project at which had three pathfinder sites at Hamilton, uh, Dundee and Paisley, uh, where bail supervision was offered uh, as uh, a support mechanism for persons on remand at those three sites. Uh, and uh, the committee may be interested um, in receiving information from the Scottish Government in relation to the data available from those three sites. Um, but there was not a direct correlation between the availability of bail supervision and a reduction in remand. There was a reduction in remand at those three sites, but that reduction in remand coincided with a reduction in the number of custody cases being reported to those sites. And one, one might well expect that if there's a reduction in the number of custody cases, de facto, there'll be a reduction in the number of persons remanded. And one of the complexities within those three sites was the very issue identified by Mr Kerr in relation to what were the reasons for remand and was, for example, bail supervision the difference in relation to remanding an individual or perhaps a support mechanism that was put in place for an individual who would have been allowed bail in any event? Because remembering that bail supervision uh, may assist an individual not only to attend court, but may also offer support to an individual with issues in their lives. And so I, I'm, not, I'm not challenging at all the value of bail supervision nor a conclusion that a more uniform provision of that would be a good. It is whether or not there's a direct correlation between the availability of bail supervision. And to see if there was a direct correlation, you see at the same time the custody has gone down, so that may have been the reason. Is it inconclusive then? It, it, it is inconclusive in the sense that the data fluctuated significantly on a monthly basis mm -hmm. in relation to yeah. numbers of remand at those three sites. Right. So I'm not... I'm not saying it, it might not have been, but it wasn't definitely but, but we were, established it, it, because it, it, of the circumstances. And because of the, the complex decision-making process and the availability of uh, bail supervision as an option in relation to all persons who are released on bail by a court. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in relation to uh, the, the, the access um, to information or the desirability of information from criminal justice social work, the sheriff is always able to ask any party who's appearing in front of it. Sorry, I, I use the word sheriff, but it, it is the court. The reality of, of, of the majority of business in front of our courts is that the majority of remand decisions will be made by sheriffs. But he or she, in statute and in practice, has the opportunity to ask any party, whether that be the Crown or, or the Defence or the Criminal Justice Social Worker, if he or she is present in court, for additional information to assist their remand decision. And, and the sheriff can also adjourn the case for 24 hours for receipt of that information. And that does happen day in and day out in our courts. 
Um, and that's reflected, for example, in the Law Society's written evidence, whereby they describe sheriffs asking for information, continuing the hearing for 24 hours to ensure that the remand decision is as informed as possible. Is that balanced? Because you mentioned the Law Society's submission, they're not represented here, um, that there was a, a question over the availability of courts. You know, so there's pressure to move business on, and maybe they don't have that luxury. Um, the, the, I, I, I have never had experience um, in 20 plus years of a court not continuing a matter to the next day because of an unavailability of a court. A custody court will sit every lawful day in every court in Scotland um, because by definition the next day's custody business will be there to call and, and it is one more case that's simply added to the next day's business. Mary, you had a, oh, sorry, Anne, and then Mary had a, a follow-up on this line of question. Two, two points. One, one just for clarification. When I, when I made mention earlier about stand-down remand and the use of, of access to criminal justice social workers, I made mention of stand-down reports. That was specifically in relation to individuals who remand, who are very often remanded into custody because they have failed to make themselves available for an appointment, fail to attend an appointment for the criminal justice social worker to prepare the criminal justice social work report. And my point was that very often that is not absolutely necessary. What a sentencer can do as an alternative is to request a stand down report. The data that we provided was that 60% of women who are remanded into custody have been in custody, have have been in, on remand before, and there's every likelihood that previous criminal justice social work reports, fairly recent, will exist. And that was my my point about the um, the the use of criminal justice social work in court for those stand down reports. That said, criminal justice social work reports are also criminal social workers are well placed to provide information for sentencers should they so wish for for bail. Um, in relation to the use of bail, I would again refer members to the statistics. Uh, in 2015 and 16, there were 7,300 requests made for bail information and only 360 bail supervision cases made. I think those statistics speak for themselves. Yeah. Um, Mary, your, your follow-up point? You. So in relation to an earlier point that was made by, uh, by Mr Strang, we'd received evidence from the police, and unfortunately there's not anyone from the police to, um, to respond to any questions today, but it was in relation to the provisions of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act, because they said that they believed that um, because of that act, they believed that that would lead to... Um, to less people being held in remand in police custody. Um, for example, I think because they have a new, there's the new ability for the police to set a bail condition of curfew. And, for, and they said for those arrested on warrant, the requirement for them to be remanded in police custody prior to court appearances sh shifted considerably with the act. Um, and it was just really to get your views on that as to whether you think that, that will or will not lead to uh, fewer people being held in remand in police custody. Uh, I see, I mean, this is a provision that's coming in next week that you're talking about, and I think, you know, this is a fair assessment of, of the likelihood that people will, there'll be fewer people um, being kept in police custody before appearing at court, but I think at the heart of um, our discussions this morning is really about the court decision to remand someone in custody, i.e. to a prison, um, and, and I suppose it's, if it, I suppose it is less likely if someone has been on police bail and has turned up, then it may be less likely that they will then be remanded in custody, in, in prison custody. So it might well um, have, that, have that effect. But I think, to answer your question specifically, yes, I think it will reduce the number of people who are appearing in court from, from police custody um, because that there's this provision for, for, um, for, for bail from the police station. Okay. Could, can I just, um, yes, please um, move on. Uh, I think part, part of the issue, and it's entirely understandable, is that the people who are making the decisions about whether someone's remanded in custody or not are those who are responsible for the administration of justice. So that, that issue about um, whether someone is likely 
um, you know, if it's considered that they're likely not to turn up at court, they're likely then much more likely to be remanded in custody because that'll bring them to court. But I suppose from a balanced point of view, and, and this is something that Theresa talked about, is the, the, the damage that someone locked up in, in prison uh, on remand, um, you know, it has the same disadvantage as a short prison sentence is, is, is that there's a break of relationships. There might be employment, there might be housing issues. Um, it might lead to them being more likely to reoffend in the long run, because we know that um, custody, uh, someone sentenced to a short prison sentence is more likely to reoffend than someone on a, on a community sentence. So um, I suppose, uh, I just think it's important that, that we kind of see both sides of this, that, that the advantage of someone in custody absolutely is that the court case is more likely to go ahead. The, the disadvantage, the downside, I think, is... is the harm that's done by those um, people in prison and, and uh, being in prison. And um, very little happens for someone who's on remand. They don't have to work, so they don't work. They've got to be kept separate from convicted prisoners. So in general, they will spend a long period of their day locked in their cell. Um, and so it's a very unproductive time uh, um, and, and also disruptive and, and damaging to other aspects of their lives. And Neri or Daniel, you wanted to follow up on? Indeed. Um, <clears throat> in the 2016-17 annual report from the, 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 the inspectorate, you, you bring up that very issue about the, the, the fact that there's a lack of uh, access to activities for prisoners uh, on, on remand. Um, I was just wondering if you, maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit further in, in terms of, of the impact and also maybe the under, underlying reasons uh, for that, and then I'd, I'd quite like to ask the prison service some of the questions. Yes. Um, so people on remand are generally there for a short time. It's not known how long they will be on remand necessarily. The case might be dropped. Um, the, the court dates will, will change. Um, but because they are innocent in law, they're not convicted, they're not required to work. Um, and because of the shortness of the time they're in custody and the lack of predictability, they tend not to get onto um, courses or, or programs, um, some medical procedures um, won't be available for them. So, for instance, in, in some prisons I know that dental services um, are only available for emergency treatment for people on remand, but, but routine uh, procedures. So, in, in general, they have a lessened regime opportunities for activities, for education, for work, because they're not required to and because they're there, there for a short time. So that's just the practical reality of life in a prison for someone who is, is on remand. So, so, I mean, can I ask then, in your view, what, what's the really sort of the underlying issue there? Is it, is it one, is it purely practical? Is it one of policy or is there an underlying resourcing issue in terms of just the, the availability of, of, of sufficient resource to, to make these things possible, particularly given that the, the, the prisons need to be kept separated? Yeah, I, I don't think it's a resource thing. I'm not arguing right. that more resources should be put in there. I think um, the, the fact of the high turnover of people on, on remand makes, you know, takes up a lot of energy and, and effort and uh, prison service um, time um, because everybody, obviously who comes in from court has to, has to be processed and have a medical examination and, and be searched and so on. Um, and um, no, I think it's just the fact that there are so many people held in custody who ultimately don't get a, get a prison sentence that um, for me adds strength to the argument that we should not be remanding so many people in custody in prison. Could maybe I give obviously um, most um, of the, the questioning or the, the, the time available to hear what the witnesses have to say. So members, if you're wondering why you haven't been called, it's the witnesses. I'll always go to as, as much as possible, Theresa. Yeah. I would just echo um, the, the um, evidence that, that David has just given. Um, we do um, experience very short periods um, that people are on remand when they come into custody. The very nature of the fact that they are on remand, they don't know or really sometimes don't understand what the implications of being on remand are for them in terms of will they um, be convicted? If they are convicted, will they then move on to a custodial sentence? So that uncertainty whilst they're in custody 
provides them with um, a degree of um, difficulty in terms of where they are in relation to engaging. So we have, um, over many years, um, made, and we continue to make attempts to um, put on activities that we consider um, those on remand might engage with, but because of consistency issues and because of um, the uh, individual's choice over whether or not they wish to engage, then it means that the um, participation is very variable. Um, a lot of the supports and activities, as, as David says, can take several weeks or months, and because of that uncertainty, if somebody starts something, they're very unlikely to finish it. So there are, are very limited opportunities for people to engage in anything meaningful, but at that point um, in their custodial experience, not knowing or understanding what their circumstances are means that not necessarily uh, people don't necessarily want to engage. Um, sometimes there can be a fear of, you know, if I say that I've got an addictions problem, then it means that will, you know, uh, have an impact on me in court. So people can be very um, suspicious, very wary, um, and part of that is just because they are so uncertain um, as to their future um, and therefore their, their willingness to engage and do so in a consistent way um, is very much impaired. Very often as well, um, I mean, that's significant. I think the last statistics that we had from our addictions prevalence testing on those coming into custody was somewhere in the region between 70 and 80% of those coming into custody do have addictions issues. So very often that will be the main um, focus, will be um, making sure that individuals are stable um, and are settled and are probably in a better frame of mind to engage with the court process um, when it comes for them to attend court. Anne, you have a view? No. Um, certainly, you know, the, when we've looked at uh, studies, you know, short-term sentences, there was little or no rehabilitation. I think the, the previous um, committee looked at that. So that's with the prison population. So if you're going to remand, then the chances of, of getting any are even more um, reduced. Um, if there's no more sort of questions around that, I'll bring Rona in now. Yeah. Well, mine was really about the, the use of remand and the levels of remand. I'm, I'm, am I right in thinking that the general opinion around the table is that remand has been used too much and would a, a lower use of remand be desirable? Mr Strang? Well, Yes, that's, that's certainly my view. I'm not sure if the current office share, share that view, but, but certainly um, from what I see in prisons, um, it, it is, uh, as I've said, an unproductive time. It does damage to people's prospects of living a successful life outside. And I think um, it, it is overused when th there are alternatives that we've heard about. And certainly, uh, I mean, obviously, electronic monitoring, the tagging is, is not an option today, but that... Um, uh, could, he's, could be a, a, an option for the future. And um, rather than just having kind of two options, one is um, kind of unconditional bail or remand in custody, I think there should be, uh, we should have different levels of supervision that are more intrusive. Obviously, tagging is, is a very intrusive because it forces someone to stay at a particular address uh, between hours. Um, and uh, there are just, there are ways of increasing that level of supervision and therefore the likelihood of their um, not offending and the likelihood of their turning up at court before we go to the, you know, the, the, the fail-safe option uh, and the very expensive option of uh, remanding someone in custody in prison. Can I, can I just address my next question to Anne um, with regards to women offenders? Um, I think you said at the start that the, the number, the statistic you had was 30% don't go on. The, 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 the statistics that the committee received was 70%. Sorry, so it was 70, 70%, yeah, which, which I, you know, I find astonishing, to be quite honest. Um, so that would clearly show that the balance, I would suggest, is not, isn't right. Um, are there, what circumstances do you think that women... Sh are there any circumstances, other than women being a danger to themselves or others, that you think they should be in remand? I, I certainly don't think, with all due respect, that any woman who's a danger to herself should be uh, remanded into well, prison. Okay. To uh, to and I think yeah. Yeah. sometimes um, mm -hmm. pr uh, prison is used yeah. too often as an alternative to a mental health facility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we know that the majority of women who, who are received into custody have experienced trauma and the levels of mental health are 
are excessive, are, are extremely high. Um, way before the, the Commission on Women Offenders um, was established, we knew that over 80% of women in custody had experienced trauma and abuse, um, and that there's nothing to indicate that that has, that that has changed. Um, in terms of, to go back to statistics, um, when you look at the, the, the nature of, as you look at the sentences that are imposed on women and indeed men, most women, and I would refer you to the, to the document that there was a link to that we recently published by the Prison Reform Trust on uh, why, why focus on women's imprisonment in Scotland, the, um, the numbers of women, 90% of the sentences that are imposed on women are less than 12 months and vast majority of those are less than six months. Uh, and if you look at the admissions of women into prison, um, unfortunately, the most recent statistic that we have and for full years is 2013-14, is where there was almost 3,000 women admitted to prison. Two-thirds of that were for remand. That imposes significant impact on the prison service, as Theresa was mentioning earlier. I suppose men and women are kept in remand. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have any, access to, to, does, does anyone have a, to that data. Uh, Theresa? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, we, we did a, a, a snapshot um, last year um, of women on remand over a, a three-month period. And at that point the average time um, was 26 days on remand. Um, so that was for the, the female population. Um, I'm not sure if I've got those statistics for men. Um, I I can look the impact of imprisonment or, 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 and indeed remand, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the impact of remand is just as, as um, disruptive and impactful on a woman on a woman's life uh, as it is a short-term sentence the impact on children we know that there's very little very little research has been done on the impact of maternal imprisonment uh, some some research on on parental imprisonment and we know that that's an adverse childhood experience recognized adverse childhood experience for children but 90% uh, of ch children who have a mother go to prison do not go on to live in the family home. Um, that said, uh, and that, that is a, that's a very concerning figure uh, and, 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 and something that the Prison Reform Trust are cur currently looking at. We're doing research on the, the impact of maternal imprisonment and we'll share the, the results of, of that with you. But there are other caring responsibilities as well. There's a loss of accommodation, loss of income, and just to add to, uh, and in, in relation to loss of income, when, um, when somebody is remanded into custody, uh, or, or beg your pardon, is released from custody from a period of remand, they do not, they, re they, they receive no discharge grant, uh, unlike individuals who are discharged from prison, who are liberated from prison, having served a custodial sentence, those individuals would receive on approximately £75 a week. So an individual, and in this, I'm using a woman who, who may have care of her children, would, would be um, would be discharged or released from remand with no, with no finance, and it would take her approximately four weeks to receive benefit. There are the most harrowing stories about how women are having to survive um, for, during that period until their benefits are reinstated. Just to add, um, of the women who um, have, ex have mental health issues or have experienced abuse, do you feel that's, is that never taken into account when they're remanded? much depends on what information is made available to the sentencer mm -hmm. and as we heard earlier today sometimes pressure time that information is not always available right. in fact I would go as far as to say probably in cases of remand less likely to be made uh, available to sentencers than not mm -hmm. than, okay. than, than that than, than being made available sorry yeah yeah okay can I ask about child impact assessments I understood that they were now available is that just for sentencing not necessarily when you're considering someone on remand they, they are not available at the point of remand um, and my understanding is that they're not routinely available uh, at the point of sentence either 
Um, this, Anthony, can you clarify that? Uh, uh, are you aware of um, child impacts and um, impact um, assessments being available before somebody is, a decision is taken about remand no. and sentencing too, because my understanding was they should be in place now. Um, I, I'm not aware of, of that information being available in relation to remand no. decisions, in relation to sentencing. That information may be available, but COPFS wouldn't see the social work report that was submitted to the sentencer. Um, so it, I think the social work department would be better placed to describe that information or sentencers. Earlier about the research that the Prison Reform Trust are currently undertaking on the effect of maternal imprisonment and what we are um, what we've established already is that in, uh, many women are failing to disclose that they have the care of children for fear that social work will swoop in and remove them from their care. So very often children, will, they will be informed, the women will, will make informal arrangements um, uh, before they before they, they appear in court and uh, are reluctant, as I say, to disclose that they have children. That's interesting. Just to finish off this area of question, Fulton, and if anyone hasn't got a point, don't worry, we'll get to you and um, there'll be a wash up towards the end. Yeah, thanks, Convener. <clears throat> and it is just following directly on from that point. Um, I was reading over the weekend and about the inquest into the death of Emily Hartley in Newhall in West Yorkshire. Uh, opened yesterday, uh, and Emily Fremd, it's following the case, was 21 years old when she was found dead. Yes, yes, I'm coming to it. But I think this is important, actually, convener. Uh, on the 23rd of April, um, she was remanded into custody. It was her first appearance in uh, custody, uh, and she set fire to herself, uh, her bed and curtains. That was the, the offence. She had a serious history of mental ill health, including uh, self-harm and drug addiction. And Deborah Coles, and I think this is a very, very powerful quote, uh, who's the director of the service inquest, said, Emily was the youngest of 12 women to take her own life in prison in 2016. And just like the many women who died before her, she should never have been in prison in the first place. This inquest must scrutinise her death and how such a vulnerable young woman was able to die whilst in the care of the state. Now, I found that very powerful when I read it. Uh, and I was keen to, to ask uh, something on this today. In a Scottish context, I know, and you've talked a lot about, about, about around the table, in a Scottish context, what can we learn from that about female eh, offending, how we treat our female prisoners, particularly in remand, given that many of the organisations say that remand and custody have the same impact eh, on people, and eh, in particular in connection to the, 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 the Scottish <laughs> Government um, succinct, um, eh, current policy eh, regards to community eh, hubs for female offending? Can't the gist of that? Mm. Well, there was a question there, convener. <laughs> Could you uh, uh, just very? Um, yeah, I'm uh, not well, sure what the question well, is. Well, well, what, what can we do to learn from that and, uh, and take for, uh, forward for the policies? Experience like yes. that happening. Uh, there is a lie. Theresa. Um, in the um, Scottish Prison Service, um, we have, over a number of years, um, experienced um, suicide in custody, and so we have developed our policy and practice um, in a multidisciplinary way um, with um, experts in their field to support us, um, and that would include people like um, the Samaritans, um, NHS colleagues, um, uh, others um, as well, and. Um, what we do is we review um, every death in custody um, and we ensure that any lessons learned um, are used then to inform both policy and practice where applicable. We ensure that our staff are trained. We have um, a, what we call our talk to me policy, um, which um, everybody who works in prison, regardless of whether or not they're a prison officer, um, receives training and familiar familiarisation so that if people come across anyone who is um, um, either distraught or has um, parasuicidal thoughts or behaviours, then they can um, use our policy to inform and we would then um, enact that policy in order to support the individual um, during that period of crisis. I think um, the, the, other, um, the other aspect to this would be that 
Um, we have also developed over a number of years our first night in custody and our admission processes to take account of that so that anyone who's coming into custody, um, and it doesn't need to be for the first time everyone is treated the same, they will go through an admission process which looks at their immediate needs and an immediate nurse assessment. Um, and that nurse assessment will take account of their presenting um, behaviours um, and um, issues at the time of admission. They are also then given, go through a first night in custody process. So during that first 24 hours, more information and support um, is made available and provided to individuals. So what we've tried to do um, over a number of years is learn from our experience in Scotland, um, set against the increasing complexity, I think is, is probably how you would describe that um, unfortunate young woman, but the increasing complexity of those cases that we are receiving um, into custody, and that would apply to men and women, unfortunately. But those coming into custody are um, presenting with more complex issues, um, and the, the experience of women, um, very similar with young people where they've experienced trauma, um, in their history and background. Um, so we are, we are developing, particularly in relation to our approach to women and young people, a much more trauma-informed approach um, and supporting our staff and others who work with us, but learning from others who work with us to improve our practice and ensure that we take account of those very complex factors um, during the period in custody um, so that we can support the individual as best we can, not just in relation to their criminogenic need, but also into, in relation to their personal needs as well. Yeah, Anne? Um, we've, we've spoke very much today about what we do as women who become involved in the criminal justice system, um, but it's also been recognised certainly within the justice strategy um, for Scotland that much more needs to be done in relation to prevention. Um, and Two, two initiatives that um, or developments that I think are very welcome, and one is the development of triage services, which are now available, albeit in different um, formats, different styles across the country, whereby police are working with NHS and where um, police become aware of, of individuals who are perhaps their behaviour um, will be caught. You know, would indicate perhaps that there may be a mental health issue, a crisis issue, that what they are doing is they now have the, the, the ability to call on colleagues within mental health services, community psychiatric nurses, and certainly in the pilot phase, it was found that almost every case was diverted successfully. Um, so rather than police officers, for example, taking along, uh, two police officers taking along an individual to hospital uh, and waiting for several hours to be seen, the the, um, they could be diverted to community psychiatric services and dealt with accordingly and more importantly um, avoiding any, any involvement in, in the criminal justice system. And that, that is now um, rolled out across the country and um, beginning to show very, very positive results and I think something that should continue to be invested in. Secondly, um, the local NHS have responsibility for the provision of health services and police custody um, suites. And again, we are seeing improving use of, of um, triage services and, pl and police custody, whereby individuals who have mental health problems are, are more readily now identify, are more identified and diverted from, custody, from the criminal justice system at that stage. And I think that is extremely welcome and an area that we should continue to develop. Before I bring David in, a lot of the comments that have related to women will also relate to men. Do we have the average time on remand for, for, for men? You were looking at that, well, um, Theresa. Which, unfortunately, are 2013 14, but over a period of years, it was um, 23 days was the median. Right, um, so it's actually higher for women, 26. Slightly. On, but those were recent, very recent figures. The figures that I'm quoting for men are not as, as, as recent. recent. So they need to update yes. So it's that caveat. Mm. David. <coughs> And just on that point of the short average time, you know, if it's a, if it's about a crime prevention method, you're only stopping them committing crimes for 23 days in the community. I wanted to comment on the issue about self harm. Now, clearly, the prison service doesn't decide who comes into prison, and therefore, um, 
you know, all that Theresa described is, is, is what they're doing in relation to um, vulnerable people who come into uh, custody. Um, we know that people who um, go through the courts who are convicted um, have high levels of addictions and mental health problems. And then on, on top of that is um, the very act of being imprisoned uh, for the first time, I think is a particularly vulnerable time. I mean, the worst thing, uh, Mr. McGregor says, but when that can happen to someone detained is that they lose their life. And um, the particular vulnerable time is the first uh, 24 hours, first two or three days when, when people are coming to terms with what's happened to them and they are, are particularly vulnerable. Uh, and that's when all the, the medical and support and, and care needs to be there uh, for them. Um, and, you know, sadly in Scotland too, uh, people do take their own lives and uh, each case is an absolute tragedy. Um, Liam, you wanted to pick up on something that you thought hadn't been fully covered. Well, no, it was just um, <clears throat> to go right back to the start, my question about data, um, because we've, t we've talked quite a lot about uh, remand being overused, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. Um, <clears throat> but I do. what I'm hearing is that there's a lack of analysis of why that decision is being taken in preference to alternatives. Uh, and particularly, Mr. Strang, I, I might ask you about, uh, you said in your evidence, it, it, in some cases it appears that remand is being used as a heavy-handed way to ensure the attendance of court for trial. Uh, now, I suspect, uh, or I, I don't necessarily disagree with that, uh, but are you able to just talk about your authority for that statement and uh, whether you have any idea what proportion uh, of people are being remanded as a heavy-handed way to, to ensure uh, their attendance. And do the courts accept that analysis, do you know? I mean, it's a great, it's a great question because you're asking about what, what I'm tasked to do, which is to inspect and monitor uh, in prison, the, the, the condition in prison and the treatment of prisoners. So, so I'm looking at it from the perspective of the experience of someone in custody, what happens to them. Uh, and for me, I'm interested in what caused them to be in there in the first place and then what happens when they leave. And, you know, Anne was talking about the liberation grant of, I think, £75 in their pocket, not £75 a week. I think that was a, a slip of the tongue. Um, so my uh, comment, and the reason I suppose I slightly qualified it by saying is it appeared, is that um, I don't, it's not my business to do an analysis of decision-making by the court. I mean, whether, whether the Scottish um, Courts and Tribunal Service could provide that data or, or the Crown Office. I mean, I think it's a very legitimate question you ask, and it might be something that the committee would want to pursue. But so I, I haven't done analysis of decision-making by sheriffs. What I am saying is that the people I speak to and I hear their life story and I see um, one after another after another, and um, I, know, I just know that you know, this time in custody is not doing them good. I think from a society point of view and, and my, my background in the criminal justice system is that actually the short period in custody is more likely to lead to more offending than less. It's not, it's not a moment of inspiration where they suddenly realise that, you know, that their life's been on the, on the wrong track and they're now going to, to change. It is um, disorientating, unsettling, stressful, um, they are, I suppose, depending whether they're guilty or not, but they can be um, um, you know, traumatised and, and um, have senses of, of shame and guilt and so on. So it's, it's not a constructive time where they're learning some new skill. They're not going to leave. I, I just think once people are into, that, uh, into the criminal justice system and going um, through the process, they leave prison, they reoffend and come back in. And, and so you know, that's partly also what I argue... Um, in favour of the presumption against short sentences is that I think it, that a short prison sentence um, in the long run does very does more harm than it than it does good. It starts from a position, I, I accept entirely the, the position on the, the effects of remand, but the people that are making that decision are making a decision. Uh, and I, I think there's an analysis <coughs> that needs to be done to say why is that decision being preferred over the alternatives? Uh, Mr. McGeehan, do you have any comment on that? Um, my, I, I, I think there, it, it is unknown um, as to the reasons 
um, for the remand of uh, the prison population as, as currently described. And that data is not available at present. Um, and that data may be useful if we wish to understand uh, whether or not the particular considerations that were prominent in decision makers' minds were, for example, the protection of the public or the administration of justice or a combination of factors um, and whether or not any of those factors could be appropriately addressed through measures such as bail supervision or electronic monitoring or mentoring or um, other uh, alternatives to remand. A position to, to bring Morris in. That was the line of question you wanted to look at, Morris. Uh, can, can I address this to David Strang? Um, in the, the Scottish Prison Commission report in 2008, it was said that um, often remands are the result of lack of information or lack of services in the community to support people on bail. Now, you made a comment just now about looking inwards at the prisoner, at the people on remand, or what have you, and through your time since you took over as the inspector, um, have you seen an improvement in the fact that there is a better assessment of people going on to remand by the courts, and also are the right things being applied within the prison service um, to the end result? Because you sort of indicated some concerns on that. Um, thank you. Well, ten years ago, I was a member of the Scottish Prisons Commission, so th those are my views then, and they're still my views now, sadly. Um, uh, so I think, I mean, I think partly people are being remanded because um, those alternative supports are not there. And I mean, that was a, a comment that I made back in 2008 when we published uh, Scotland's Choice. Um, and uh, as we've heard this morning, that the provision, well, the there is no provision of electronic monitoring uh, as an alternative to remand in custody at the moment. And the provision of bail supervision um, is patchy across the country. It's inconsistent. And I think you know, if, if, there were, if there was confidence within the judiciary that uh, an effective uh, bail supervision um, was in place in every local authority area, then I, I'm sure they would use it. I would sure, sure they would use it more. So I think it's a, it's a it's a lack of those services. And in fact, we've heard I think it was um, in one of the written pieces this morning that the service in Southwest Scotland has been um, the funding has been withdrawn for that. So so rather than having more confidence that this is being spread out, actually my fear is that that it's being restricted and and some of these uh, services are, are are not being uh, delivered. So in a, in a sense, um, where my remit is, which is about the experience of people in prison, it, it's kind of too late by then, but I'm wanting to contribute to the, the, the public debate about um, the use of imprisonment and you know, how we could um, support the judiciary to be making better informed decisions by the provision of, of good alternatives to custody, both in terms of a sentence, so not a uh, sentence in the community, and also uh, remand. Can I just pick up on one point, community? Very quickly, Mr. Strang. You said um, the, the lack of the local authorities being able to deliver, you know, the necessary services. Why do you think that is? Uh, maybe political will. It's not, you know, it's not a priority. It's clearly, I mean, often I find when I'm arguing for services for people in, in prison and criminal justice system, um, there's quite a um, very judgmental attitude. People think, well, you know, it's your fault you're in prison, you've committed the crime, why should we be providing services for you? If, you know, if you're a, a local authority councillor, you've got limited budget, <laughs> is someone coming out of prison going to be top of your priority? I suspect there's, there's a bit of political reality that, um, this particular group of marginalised people in Scotland um, don't particularly have people championing their, their case and they're probably a low priority in terms of um, local authority priorities. I think, I think that's a mistaken view because because crime has an impact much wider than just on that individual. And I think if we support people who are vulnerable to uh, offending, uh, if we, you know, right from school and, and, and uh, as they grow up, uh, then the benefits are for the whole community uh, as it can become uh, safer and more confident. Thank you. 
Dr. Leighton, maybe to, um, to comment on what is available locally. When the Crown agent came in, I think the committee was very heartened in the back of our Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service inquiry that um, he was going to look at geographical differences and try and see where there was um, resources available or um, good practice or, or whatever available that maybe hadn't been properly identified so far and that was something they were going to, to look in at. Local solutions almost. I, I think that that mapping um, is being carried out but that's in relation to diversion yeah. as opposed to bail supervision which is... I th kind of exercise be helpful then for bail supervision? Um, it, it, it may be. Um, I, I just don't know what, what central organisation holds data in relation to the provision of bail supervision um, across Scotland. So from your point of view as a, a, a fiscal then, do you feel you've got that information when you're looking at the whole case? Um, we... We do, well, we, where bail supervision is available, um, then there is a link between the local criminal justice social work department and COPFS, mm -hmm. um, but that national picture is not held by COPFS. Okay. Um, Anne? That picture of bail supervision services could be, um, could be found by asking uh, local authority criminal justice social work services in, in each area. What, what it is that they, that they provide. And just if I may, in terms of cost of, um, of bail supervision, um, the, the, the figures that are, that are the, the most recent figures that are available um, are for 2014-15, whereby there was just over a million pound invested in, in bail supervision across Scotland. Um, and that paid for 402 bail supervision cases, which provided a unit cost of £2,636, to be precise. Um, and when you look at the comparison of bail supervision um, costs with the cost of imprisonment, which is currently over £36,000 per annum, I think the figures speak for themselves. Absolutely. Um, yes, Mr... A piece of research that is dated 2012, which is on the Scottish Government website, which is Supervised Bail in Scotland, Research on Use and Impact. Um, and, that, and that is a survey and, and research on the use of uh, supervised bail across Scotland. Okay. Um, <coughs> before we go on to Ben's um, line of questioning, Daniel, you had a small Just clarification. A data point in, in, in uh, following up on uh, Liam Carr's line of questioning. Is there data on the proportion of uh, those uh, on remand who then either go on to non-custodial sentences or indeed found uh, not guilty? Because obviously that would provide a, an insight into the, the point that's being made about people being put in prison when they, they don't need to be there. I don't know if that's available now or could be supplied subsequently. Well, I, I don't have that. I mean, the, the figure that's been quoted was in the um, Angelini Commission on Women Offenders, and that was 70% at that time. But, I mean, that was published five years ago as well. So I don't know who has that data, but it must be available. Anne? I think the ESGS, do have some data about... Um, the number of individuals who are received into custody and liberated um, each month. Um, but it's difficult to ascertain, um, there's a disconnect between the, the statistics that, that the, the SPS collect, it's my understanding, and the Scottish Court's data, whereby individuals who, who, are, who are remanded will be captured in the SPS data, but if they are then liberated, from courts, that's where the disconnect is, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you for that. Ben. Convener, on those individuals who are remanded in custody but are, uh, then do not receive a prison sentence and are acquitted, um, do we have a sense of what impact the time spent on remand has on those uh, individuals in terms of particularly family relationships, housing and employment and uh, what is being done to assist those who are released after a period of remand and what, what more could and should be done. I know you mentioned uh, social security earlier. Uh, so interested to expand on those areas. 
there is, there is no statutory obligation on any service that I'm aware of to provide services to individuals who are liberated from remand. Um, and it's, there, there are services who will support individuals, but it's, it's a question of those individuals being identified and either accepting the support or, or alternatively those, those individuals being aware of the support that's available. But you're absolutely right, when an individual is, is um, liberated from remand or is freed from the walk from the court, they have to resolve their, their benefits issues. They have to resolve their issues in relation to accommodation. They're, if they were, they were receiving housing benefit, they need to make a, a, a claim for, for housing benefit if they've not already done so whilst they were in custody. Um, and they need to address, um, perhaps, they have an issue in relation to health. So, for example, if they have a, a, their own prescribed methadone, for example, they will have to make their own on arrangements to um, get an appointment with with their GP, if they so there's it's very much the, the individual is very much left to their own devices unless they are willing to accept support. Should should individual be should services already be aware of them? Uh, so it's it's that's the situation as, as it is. And there's no statutory obligation on any serve on any single on any agency to proactively provide a service to somebody who is liberated on remand. I, I, I do that in relation to those who are uh, acquitted, as you said in your question. I think it, in terms of someone who's sentenced to a supervised community sentence, so a community payback order, that could have a condition that they have to tackle their addictions or, um, uh, yeah, addictions um, uh, issues then, there would be some form of supervision in the community by criminal justice social work and and that might lead to some support in in some of the issues that you raise but certainly someone who um just walks from from court um unconvicted there'll be no support for them okay Teresa. And right, there is, there is no statutory obligation there for those who come into remand and um, bear in mind what's already been said about the variable nature of the length of time somebody will spend on remand. It's very difficult for them and for others to um, plan any support round about them due to the fact they can attend court at any time and then, and then be released. And as David's just alluded to, um, I think the, the figure for men is, is round about 50% go on to um, a non-custodial disposal. Now, we don't know how many of them will be found not guilty or go on to a non-custodial dis disposal. Um, so, therefore, there may well be, through um, other mechanisms, some support um, available to individuals um, just because they haven't returned to custody, but, but we don't know that. Um, SPS do undertake a, a survey every two years. Our 2017 survey is almost ready for publication um, and part of that this time will include um, a separate section on remand which will give us a lot more data around about the impact um, on remand. But we do have statistics from previous surveys around about the impact um, of imprisonment on, on individuals' um, homelessness um, and um, the, the number of people who are leaving and not really knowing or understanding um, what their accommodation um, arrangements are going to be. What I would say to you, though, is that what we are doing is we are, we are working with a number of um, partner agencies. So um, just before Christmas, um, in partnership with COSLA and a lot show, and I'll have forgotten somebody, um, so I'll get into trouble for that, but, but we developed a set of housing standards which um, apply to everybody in custody. Um, and that was signed up by all of those, um, all of those organisations and bodies to provide um, support for individuals leaving custody. Um, so we are working towards um, trying to address um, some of the issues that we know and understand um, have an impact on individuals leaving custody, whether or not they're on remand or um, convicted. But certainly, um, from our own perspective, um, we are learning more from our through care support officers who are prison officers and working with short term um, prisoners moving into community. We're learning and understanding the impact both of imprisonment and of the, the requirement to link with other services um, and things like health, benefits, housing and trying to 
improve that um, experience for individuals through individual support from our staff, as well as creating these um, arrangements with other national organisations to try and improve the standard arrangements around about support for individuals leaving custody. Okay. And Ben? Welcome that, that work, and I'd be interested to receive more information in, in writing following this meeting, if that, if that would be available, okay. um, to, to come into that. Can, can yes, we come on to their points, convener? Uh, yes, please. Is that okay? Thank you. Um, so, so we talked about the, the individual involved, and but from uh, particularly from uh, working with Circle Scotland, who are uh, headquartered in my constituency, there's there's an impact on the family as well that's that's, that's not been touched on yet. So I wondered if if and perhaps starting with you again, if you could uh, just uh, talk about what impact the that remand has on the families of those in, uh, held in custody and, and what is being done to help families and is, is there, again, more that can be done? I mean, I, I would um, refer, refer members to the submission um, that was provided for you by families outside. Uh, I think one of the, one of the um, key issues that... Um, that that that, ever, that, that that provided by in, this, in that submission was in relation to the the impact the impact that a remand has on families is the same as an impact of a, a, a custodial sentence, and children in particular, it's very difficult to um, get them to understand the difference between a remand. Um, uh, somebody being in prison for, for remand and somebody being in prison but for a, for a, for a sentence. Um, and there are particular challenges and, and, uh, for, for families supporting individuals on remand, not least the uncertainty. Um, and David made mention earlier today about the, the, um, <clears throat> the ability of, of remand prisoners to receive regular visits, and that's absolutely right. Um, my understanding is that, that, that um, people and individuals on remand can receive visits on a daily basis, um, and they are innocent. So that you know that that is perfectly correct. However, that brings with it huge pressures on families to visit in terms of cost, <coughs> um, time, travel and indeed the impact on, on the family. Not, um, the assisted prison visit unit, if somebody is, uh, exists, um, there's an existence, at, um, will, will provide payment for the cost of visiting twice a month if somebody's on, on benefit. And we know that many, many families feel under pressure to visit on a daily basis, um, or certainly, more than once or twice per week, and I say that that brings huge pressure on families. It also has the same impact, um, or, or, or has a similar impact rather, on um, benefits. If um, one of the one of the the, the adults is is imprisoned, and um, that can take quite some time for uh, the 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 payments to be. To, um, to be adjusted, um, so so yes, and the and the uncertainty is is considerable, and we do know that the I'm just repeating myself now that the impact on families is the same as that of of imprisonment. It's it's no it's no no less, and in some in, in some respects greater. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just uh, lastly, convener, um, moving things back to almost where the, the conversation started around public protection and the uh, the need for, for that side of this debate as well. Do perhaps Anthony or, or David particularly want to touch on what can be done to ensure that the interests of victims and their families are not adversely affected by measures to reduce the use of remand? Just the... The, the use of remand. Yeah. Well, my... David. Thank you. Um, and, I mean, my starting point was that remand is absolutely necessary for public protection. So if someone is um, uh, awaiting trial for a serious offence, and um, then I think it's absolutely proper that they are remanded in custody uh, if, they're, if there's a risk of them reoffending and, and causing uh, more harm. 
Um, and therefore, I think that is in the interest of um, uh, any potential future victims, which is, I suppose, you know, the victim that's already been victimised, that event has happened. And clearly, justice requires that the perpetrator should be dealt with um, through due process of law. But I think in terms of prevention, what we're wanting to make sure is that there aren't more victims. So I think um, people being remanded on, for serious offences where there's a risk to serious harm, then that is, is appropriate. Um, I think in terms of what we're talking about, where people are remanded for 26 days, we're talking about the lower end. Um, and um, if a short period in prison is likely to lead to more victims, then we're not serving future victims by remanding people in, in custody for, for short periods. So I think that would be my argument, that we're more likely to be reducing victims in the long run and looking after their interests if uh, people who have been charged and appearing before the court are uh, supported um, up th through the, the period up, up to um, trial rather than being remanded in custody. Can I pick up on that? We, we've concentrated maybe on the average time, but in the Law Society's um, submission, they're talking about you know, the time limits, wanting to remind people as short a time as possible, but often extensions being asked for, and they proffer the reasons for that being complex cases, um, such as seizure, serious organised crime, murder, sexual offences, terrorism. And also, they say very clearly, so I suppose it's one for you, Mr. McGeehan, that um, what is clear that the extension is not to be granted where the Crown is responsible for repeated, inexcusably, wholly unexplained major errors resulting in an inability to bring the accused to trial within the prescribed time, uh, time frame uh, through no fault on the part of the Crown. Um, so I, I, I believe it may be a, a, an application for extension to time bar. It may be a resource issue is what the law society is, is um, getting at. Can you comment on that? Um, my reading of that, uh, Chair, was that an extension wouldn't be granted in those circumstances. Um, and therefore, an extension would only be granted in circumstances where those factors were not present. He was saying it may not be fatal, the lost society, the extension of the time bar, even though all these things um, have happened repeatedly and excusably, wholly unexplained, major errors. And we know the, the, the pressure that is on the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service, so I suppose it was a comment on that. Well, well the comment I would make is that any application to an extend a time bar is considered by the court um, and that the factors identified by the law society would not justify an extension. And so I'm afraid I read, I read that, that, that piece of evidence in a different way, in the sense that if those factors were present, that would not justify an extension. So um, if an extension is granted by the court, one can assume that there is good reason for that extension, um, separate from any of those factors which are identified as negative factors by the law society. Anyone else want to pick up on that, David? I just make the general comment that um, you know, having time limits contributes to a more efficient criminal justice system, the administration of justice, and, and that's in the interest of both the accused and victims and society generally that um, a, a case proceeds to trial as soon as possible. I've, you've mentioned terrorist cases and um, um, technical cases, cybercrime can be very complicated to, to investigate and prepare a case. Um, but in comparison with some you know, international comparisons, some countries where people are in prison for three or four years before getting to trial. And, and I think that that's a, it's a very positive aspect of criminal justice system in Scotland that there are time limits and we do, you know, people are not uh, in, in custody awaiting trial uh, indefinitely. There is, a, there is a time limit. Okay, any other comments? If not, that concludes our roundtable discussion. Can I thank you all very much? There's no doubt that the information you've supplied and the issues that you've raised are ones that I'm sure the Justice um, Committee will want to follow up on. So thank you so much for spending the time and um, breathing the elements to, to be here. Um, it's been very worthwhile. 
Uh, we now move into private session. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 23rd of January, when we will have a briefing from the Scottish Law Commission on their definition, uh, defamation report. We will also have an evidence session on policing in Scotland. And I suspend to allow the witnesses to leave and the public gallery to clear. Five minutes, ten minutes break. <laughs>